Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alamin, Wassalatu Wassalam, Ala Sayyidil Anbiya, Yulam Mursalin, Wa Ala Alihi, Wa Ashabi Ajma'in, Wa Man Ihtada Bihadihi, La Yawmidini, Wa Ba'd. Alhamdulillah, all praises and gratitude to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, for having halawin us, and bestowing upon us the favors that we can continue with another of our series from the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And today, marks our 10th hadith into the compilation of Imam Nawawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And this hadith was reported on the authority of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Verily, Allah the Exalted, Allah Ta'ala is tayyib, Allah is pure. And Allah does not accept but that which is pure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers with what he commanded the messengers. Peace be upon him, upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, Ya ayyuhal rusulu, Kulu min tayyibati ma wa'amalu saliha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the messenger this, and which means that, O messenger, eat of the good things and act righteously. And the command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave towards the believers, which is similar to that of the prophets, peace be upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the believers, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, kulu min tayyibat ma razaqnakum. Eat from the good things, all those who believe, eat from the good things which we have provided for you. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued his hadith. He mentioned of a case, he mentioned of a scenario, he mentioned of an incident that took place of a man. He journeyed far and wide. He traveled on a long journey and traveled through the desert. And in the desert, when people travel, he became, his hair, hair became disheveled. His body, his clothes become, became dusty. And such a person was traveling, became disheveled here with disheveled hair and with dusty clothes. He stretches out his hand to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He stretches to the sky, supplicating to Allah, saying, O oh Rabb, Ya Allah, Ya O oh Lord, O oh Lord, while the food that he consumes is unlawful, it is haram. The drink that he consumes was unlawful and haram. The clothing that he wears was unlawful and haram. And he is nourished with unlawful things. So how can his dua be answered? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Mention of this incident, mention of such a person, and then Rasulullah said, He supplicated to Allah, but his eating, his drinking, his, his nourishment of his body was all from unlawful things. And if he is nourished by unlawful, how can he expect his dua to answer? So, this is a understanding, this is a, the translation towards the hadith of which Rasulullah narrates on the authority of Abu Hurairah. Here, the word used Rasulullah used in the hadith. Prophet of Tayyib, Inna Allah Tayyib, that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Tayyibun, La yakbalu illa Tayyiba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure, as I've translated it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't accept, accept things that is pure. The word Tayyib, we find it used time and time again, we find it used in numerous places in Quran and Hadith. It is a word which is used to describe good action, describe people, Describe things, speech, etc. in various forms and in all of these aspects it is used in describe. So from this we can understand that the term tayyib, the term pure, which is used here is a form of describe, is an adjective, it's a describing word to describe a sifat or a certain type of qualities in regards to a speech, in regards to an action, in regards towards our things that we eat, as in this hadith, or things that we drink. So it is an adjective, it is used to describe certain things. So here, whenever it is used, obviously the description it is given is regard to something which is good, something which is pure. The translation of pure was given under the commentary of Ibn Rajab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, a great scholar. He interpreted this word tayyib to be that of tahir in Arabic. Tayyib, he said, it is the same meaning, it is that meaning of tahir, and tahir, which translate to be pure. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam addressing us and is telling us at the very beginning, Inna Allah tayyibun. The very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is pure. Which means that all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the attributes of perfectness, of perfection and completeness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. 
He has all of these qualities from which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any kind of shortcomings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any kind of weakness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any sort of needs. That is all included in the meaning of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. What is Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being tayyib. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure. He has every perfection. And, and has mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accept that which is pure. That is referring to all good things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept any deeds that is spoiled. As we did from the very beginning, the first hadith, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ For our action to be, to be accepted, it need to be according to the intention solely for the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it must not have any intention that will ruin it. Similarly, for the action to be accepted also need to be pure, having sole intention for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The deed that we have at, or we done, the salah that we perform, must not be for showing off or that people may see that you are praying or say, oh, subhanallah, mashallah, you're such a pious person. The wealth that we have in regards to being pure, the wealth, the money, the mal, it must be from lawful sources. The income of it must be from Good source, halal source, pure, pure source, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encourages, or which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not prohibit it against. Such an example, indulging in riba, in interest, such unlawful act. So, Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam admonishing us, reminding us here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepts that which is pure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers. You and I as Muslims, in the same manner as he commanded the messengers, his prophets, which was sent to remind mankind, which was sent to call people towards him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the prophets in Surah Mu'minun, verse, verse 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed him saying, Ya ahiyya rusul, kulu min al-tayyibat, that all messengers eat from the pure things, eat from the good things. And in Surah Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the Muslims, O oh, you who believe, ya ayyuh ladhina amanu, kulu min al-tayyibat ma razaqnakum. Eat from the good things in which we have provided for, we have provided you with. Eat from the good things which we provided you with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the same command to the messengers and to the believers. This is a lesson for you and I to reflect upon, to ponder upon, to realize, and to come to the realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command us the same command that he has commanded the prophets. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, that's such a high rank, that's such an elevated status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they were special chosen people from among mankind, from among humankind. So from the verses of this hadith, from the verses of this ayat, and from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are a lot of beneficial and useful things that we can derive from all of the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from this hadith, we learn that the wealth and money that a Muslim earn must be pure, it must be legal, it must be halal, it must be from a correct source. The food that we consume must be lawful, it must be halal, it must be from a pure source. The drinks that we consume, that we drink, it must be from a pure source, it must be from a halal source. So the money that we utilize to buy food or supplements and to nourish our body must also be halal that we spend in. So the keys for acceptance of our deeds by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regards, regards to our wealth, or regards to our consumption, must be pure and legal. Whether something is permissible or prohibited, is, it is only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then explains, he reveals Quran, telling us and guides us which are permissible and which is not. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us in the hadith, Al-halal ubayyin wal haram ubayyin. That halal is evident and clear, and haram, it is evident and it is also clear. So what was there to explain or to prohibit us or to allow us from was already been done. It is Allah's haq, it is Allah's right to make things halal, to make things lawful and to make things unlawful. And we as Muslims, that is what gave us the name Muslim, that we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We submit towards the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are submitting wholeheartedly in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rule, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's law, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. Saying the word of La ilaha illallah on our lips is not, is not what gives us the name as Muslim, the title as Muslim. 
the word Muslim I've mentioned comes from Salama, Seen, Lam, and Meme. And when you give it the word Muslim, it tell, telling you that you are someone who submit towards something. And this is submitted toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from this, a very important point that earning and consuming of lawful things, of halal things, it is an important condition for acceptance of our dua, for acceptance of our supplications to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we've seen at the ending of the hadith in which Rasulullah saw mention of the incident. But let's look at another lesson that we learn from this hadith. Another lesson that we learn is that of adab, is that of manners and etiquette in which mentioned in this hadith regards to dua. An etiquette and manners which this person supplicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, humbled himself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I mentioned at the very beginning, there are many and various hadith, um, lessons from hadith that we can get from Rasulullah sallallahu some statement. But obviously we're only going through a few points and a few lessons from the hadith that we, we are doing from this compilation. But scholars will derive many as much as 10, 20 plus lessons from one single hadith that we can always derive from the statement of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So yes, coming back to another lesson is that we learned the manners and etiquettes of doing dua, which is mentioned in this hadith. And from one, goes back to the main point, is that earning, of, uh, earning and consuming of lawful things and permissible things is one of etiquettes and one of the manners of when one wants to supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another thing, as we know, from one of the times in which dua is being accepted, there are various times in which it has been accepted, such as, for example, a fasting person, a person who is sick. And from one of those times is a person who is traveling. And we see from this dua, this person, from this hadith, sorry, from this hadith, this person who made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was a traveler. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was showing us this person, he was not just supplicating to Allah anyhow, but he was a traveler. He had qualities of which duas are being accepted. He was a traveler and one of those, that is one of the conditions in which Dua is readily accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was a traveler supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not that, another one of the lesson, Rasulullah sallam showed, he, and mentioned he was disheveled, he had disheveled hair. He was in dirty clothes, his clothes was dusty. And this shows, these two are signs that shows also of humility, of humbling oneself. And this is one of the qualities also in dua that we humble to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because imagine the person that we see begging and asking for money. They don't come in fancy suit and tie. They don't come dressed up neatly in fancy dresses, in shalwar kameez or in thawb and in big brands. They don't come wearing an old navy. In fact, when they come to ask you of something, they're wearing the most despicable type of clothes and garment. The most despicable wear that many a times is stuck for Allah, na'udhu billah, may Allah safeguard us, that many a times when they approach us something, we just want to turn our face away. Why? Because of the stench maybe that's omitting from them. So humbling ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a very most important, one of the most important traits in when supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are asking from Malik al-Muluk, the king of all kings, we are asking from the sustainer of the entire universe. We are asking from Ar Razak, the sustainer. Then, if we are asking, we need to show that our need is independent of him. We cannot be boastful and we cannot be saying, Oh, if you want to give me, you give me, oh Allah. But no, we ask because we know no one can give except from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another lesson we learned that this person supplicated, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. Rasulullah also mentioned he raised his hand towards the sky, supplicating to Allah. So another etiquette of this dua, of dua that we learn from this hadith is that we raise our hand whenever we want to supplicate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, we may argue that it, may, it is not needed because whatever we want to supplicate doesn't need to come from the tongue, it comes from the heart. But if we want to show our need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we need to humble ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we want to ask someone in this world forgiveness, many a times people will tell you, if they don't want to forgive you, just go on your knees and beg them. So if we do that to mankind, imagine 
the creator of mankind, how we should, the creator of the one who can provide all of our needs, how should we humble ourselves in front of him? How should we show our need in front of him? So that is another part of etiquette that we learn from this dua, uh, from this hadith in making dua. Second, um, third aspect is that our eagerness in performing the dua and our supplication. Whenever we supplicate, how eager are us, are, how eager are we in when we ask in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The hadith was full of some use the word, the person supplicated is saying, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Allah, oh Allah. You're showing your eagerness by calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned even that a person who memorized the 99 names of Allah and supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer a person's prayer because why are you calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name? Walillahi al-asma'ul husna fad'uhu biha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belong all the beautiful names. So call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out with them. Supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Show your eagerness in calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's from a high form of ibadah that we show our need when asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. So if these etiquettes which is mentioned in this hadith are not observed, then it is only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding to our dua being accepted or not. And similarly, if we observe these etiquettes, inshallah, by the will of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be ready to accept our dua. Obviously, once the conditions that we are supplicating, when our consummation is all halal and pure things, when our dresses is all halal and pure and from halal source, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely be ready to accept our supplication, our dua. Another thing and another lesson that we can derive and from this hadith is that sadaqah, charity, will only be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is from, if it is from lawful sources. And that is obviously based on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the word is that inna Allah tayyib la yakbalu illa tayyiba that really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and Allah does not accept things except that which is pure. So wealth which is obtained from unlawful sources it shall not be given as sadaqah or it shall not be used in performing any form of worship for example performing hajj or for a person wants to you know do community service to, or to give charity to someone who wants to build a house and help them in building a house one cannot utilize those type of wealth in which was from an unlawful source and expecting rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a form of ibadat in this reason ibn abbas radiallahu anhu he mentioned he says filth does not expiate filth the wealth is filth and you're giving it, which is filled, it will not expiate the filth that you're doing. For in a simple term, you get the money from a haram source. So now you want to give something good and say, oh, inshallah, by me giving this money out good, it will expiate that sin. But no, this wealth itself, it is also filled because the source of it is filled. A person's, an example is a person stole money. Maybe a person as every saint had a had a past and as far as probably in his past he was a robber he used to steal money he's a thief and he probably had money from somewhere he stole it and now he wanted to change he turned a new leaf of his life he made tawbah he made repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and now he this wealth that he had from which he stole he wanted to give it away in charity the source of this wealth was already from haram and unlawful source so now to give this unlawful wealth as a form of charity, expecting it to be a form of expiating of the sin, it cannot happen. And that is why the statement of Ibn Abbas anhu that filth does not expiate filth. So, whenever we have something which is from a haram source, we for us, how do we get rid of that and how or how do we expiate that? We need to look for the owner uh, and where from the owner which we got that money from, the source of the owner. Maybe if that person passed away, we have to look for their offspring, the one who inherited from them, and we have to return that money towards them. That is the only way we can expiate that filth and that wrongful income of that money. So, in regards to wealth, this is something very important that many times we may not realize how we accumulate the wealth. We may not take into consideration where the wealth comes from. In a very simple and small matter, it can be a form of disastrous for us because it is from an unlawful source 
and we not take heed, we not pay heed towards it. And now when we want to utilize it in a good way, with our good intention, it will not be accepted because the origin source of it was already unlawful. And another aspect of this, which I would like to highlight, is that of a word you refer to in Arabic as kulul. Today, this word kulul is referred to as deception. And it is also a form of looting money, but in not a way that we may realize and we may perceive it. And this is referred to, um, this happens in regards to public belongings. For example, something which is a property of an organization or a company or even an institution. And maybe you're working in an office and you have pen or you have some highlighters that you can utilize in the office. And accidentally you just say, okay, I'm doing the work for the office and I need to go home. I I'll probably carry on with some work. So you took the pen out and you walk. You went with it and you go home. You complete the file work for that, for the office at home. But now you need to do something. You need to write just a tiny word or a tiny note, personal note, which had nothing to do with the work. And you wrote it with that pen. Now, eventually, that is a sort of utilizing public belonging without a consent. So that is what referring to kulul. And many of us, sadly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and safeguard us from utilizing and committing this error. That many of us, we end up utilizing things which is not an under, under our personal property, but we utilize it because we are so connected to it that we consider it as if, you know, it is under my care. I, I can use it as my personal as my, in my personal affairs. And with regards to that, we end up utilizing something for our personal gain, which was not meant for our personal gain. So we need to realize and we need to understand and try to focus and keep our mind set that even in this aspect, if something is under our trust, but it does not belong to us, we should not utilize it in our personal agenda. If it is not from our own personal finance and our own personal money, we need to create awareness among Muslims also to be more responsible regarding this and not to indulge in the word of kulul, in this aspect of kulul, in regards to things as public possession. And one of the contemporary hadiths, uh, one of the contemporary issues which we can derive from this hadith before we close in, is that of two things. One, the things that we eat, both of them actually has to do with things that we eat, but one is regarding to the ingredients of the food items that we have. Today in our time, in the contemporary times that we live in, the packet food or the canned food, especially if they're imported or especially from they're from companies we have no idea about, we need to be aware of the ingredients and the things that we're consuming. Make sure it is from a lawful source, it's from pure source. Another thing is that many of the products or many of the things that we eat cause health problems. We need to be more aware of the health aspects of the food also. Not only of the ingredients, but also of the health aspect. And that it will make our body also pure, healthy. It will make our body more pure that we can consider and we can be able to continue, continue doing good act of deeds for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I will close with one statement which scholars always mention that whatever we eat, it affects our attitude and our behavior. So this is why it is very important to look at what we eat, what we consume into our body, because whatever we consume into our body is the fuel. You cannot put a uh, you cannot put diesel into a gas tank. It will mess up the whole engine of a system. Similarly, we cannot put something which is unlawful into our body and expect our body to continue acting and the attitude and the behavior of our body to continue being that which is pure. So whatever we consume, that will affect our outcome. So inshallah, I pray and beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he help us to consume only that which is tayyib, which is pure, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us that we can become those people which is tayyibun, which are pure people also, solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah accept us all. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Jazakumullah khair. Aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.